Let's see, this is going to be a little challenging for me because I've got this cord and they say I've got to be mic'd up and um, this is the way they got it set up. So all of you should have a handout, yes? Everyone have one? Yeah, if not, my daughter, my assistant back there, Hannah, she can help you. So here's what we're going to do, guys. Today we're going to talk about your money, your wealth, how to build your wealth, how to pay off your debt, pay off your expenses, all with keeping total control of your money without having to work any harder, without having to change your cash flow or take any additional risk. The concept that I'm going to go over with you today is going to definitely be outside of the box thinking. It's not what you've been taught about money. It's not what your parents taught you. It's not what your grandparents taught you. It's not what your friends, your coworkers, or your colleagues are doing. So this is outside of the box, so I want you to keep an open mind as I go through this. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm not going to ask you to buy anything. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to have your name or your contact information at all unless you decide at the end of this just to like turn that into me and give it to me. Um, anyway, I speak on this concept. I travel around the country. I do 50 to 70 live events a year. Um, I've spoken on the Grant Cardone stage. You guys ever heard of a guy named Les Brown? I speak on Les Brown stages. Um, again, I'm all over the country. We were in Pennsylvania on Saturday. We come back here to Dallas next week, then go to Salt Lake City and Denver. So we're all around the country. If you go to our website, which is themoneymultiplier.com, if you go to the homepage of the website, if you scroll down there at the bottom, the thing you'll see is all the locations that we're speaking at around the country. So anyway, so my name is Brent Kessler, and there's my contact information up there. The website I said is themoneymultiplier.com. I live in Port Orange, Florida, which is about an hour east of the, which is about an hour east of Orlando, an hour east of Orlando. It bumps right up next to Daytona Beach. And um, anyway, I, I uh, so yes, yeah, so like I grew up in Florida. I grew up on the west coast of Florida, around the Fort Myers Cape Coral area. Then I moved, um, and so like I went to chiropractic school in St. Louis. And after I got out of chiropractic school, I moved to Kansas City, opened up chiropractic clinics. I had five chiropractic clinics in Kansas City. I haven't practiced since 2009. Um, I had associate docs in all my clinics. I sold the last one that I had in 2017. My wife and I became empty nesters. We decided it was time to get out of the cold weather and move back to Florida. And the reason we picked the town where we live at is Port Orange is because I am an aviation enthusiast, and um, there's a really cool air park down there. It's called Spruce Creek Fly-In, and a lot of you guys might know it, it, it. It's kind of known for where John Travolta lived. And anyway, I wanted an airplane hangar attached to my house, so that's why I moved to Florida. So I got the weather and you know the aviation community as well. Um, so, so the girl passing out the handouts, the lady passing out the handouts, my 21-year-old daughter, Hannah, she um, is my assistant. She's like my right hand. She works with me um, as well. So all these events that I do, that I speak at, I get asked to come and speak at them. Everything I do is word of mouth and referral. I don't do any marketing. I don't do any advertising whatsoever. Um, so again, just keep an open mind as I go through this concept because this is probably going to be unlike anything that you've heard before about your money and how money actually works. Before we end today, I'm going to actually show you, oh, let me make sure this is on, get my technology going here. All right. So anyway, before we end today, I'm going to show you how I paid off $984,711 in debt in 39 months. Three years and three months, all right, without working harder, changing my cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control. Now, you're probably thinking, how does a guy from Kansas, because again, so remember, I was in Kansas up until just a couple years ago, you're probably thinking, how does a guy from Kansas get to be almost a million dollars in debt, right? Now, I know if you live in California, that buys a very small house, but in Kansas, it buys a lot, right? Well, anyway, I had my primary home as part of my debt. I had my student loans from chiropractic school. I had my um, chiropractic clinic, all right? 
And also we have a place on the Lake of the Ozarks between St. Louis and Kansas City. And if you have a house on a lake, you have to have a boat and a wave runner, don't you? I mean, you can't have a house on a lake without a boat and a wave runner, right? And as I said, I'm an airplane pilot, so if you're an airplane pilot, you have to have your own airplane. So it didn't take me a lot to become almost a million dollars of debt. Well, I was able to pay that off in 39 months, and I'm going to show you how I did that. Also, before we end today, I'm going to show you how to get all the money back on all the cars you're ever going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. So not only do you have the car, but you get the money back. And here's what I mean by that. See, the thing that all of you guys in the audience have done up to this point the only way that you've bought cars is one of three ways. You've either paid cash for them, you've bank financed them, or you've leased them, right? You all look like an honest bunch, so I don't think you stole any of the cars, did you? So the thing is, is that you bought your cars one of those three ways. But in order for you to buy that car, what you had to do was you had to take your money and you had to give it to the car dealer. And in exchange, the car dealer gives you the car. He's got the money, you got the car, everybody walks away happy, yes? So I'm going to show you how to buy the car where you can take your money, you're going to give it to the car dealer, the car dealer is going to give you the car, but now we have a system to get all of the money back for those cars that we just bought. Would that be pretty cool? Would that be worth the time for the next hour or so if I show you how to do it? Okay. So, like I said, I'm not here to sell you anything, but hopefully if you like this concept and if you decide to do it, that you'll do it with me, all right? Now, there is a book, there's actually three books I'm gonna share with you today that you actually want to add to your wealth building library. And the first one is a book that totally changed my financial life. It's called Becoming Your Own Banker by a guy named R. Nelson Nash from Birmingham, Alabama. Has anyone heard of this book? Nobody, not one? You, you guys have, right? Wow, okay. Well, anyway, the thing is, the author, Nelson, he was 86 or 87, 88? He was 88, so we lost him in March, so that was a sad day. But this guy totally changed my financial life, and I've seen him change the, the financial lives of so many others just by the content, what's in this book. He also has two other books as well. And, and um, again, I'll talk about just not those books, but I'll talk about a couple other ones as we go through. So if you... Again, just like I said, this is a book you want into your financial library. The thing, you can order it on Amazon. You can go to our website and order it. If you order it from us, it comes with a book and two hours of audio, all right? Because if you're like me and you have a little ADD going on, you like the audio as well. So if you buy it from us, we sell it to you for $45. Now, the thing is that you can't buy it here. I think we bought like two copies, right? This one and one other one. But... Um, so, and again, so the reason I'm telling you, if you buy it from us, we sell it to you for $45, I give you a 45-day guarantee. So the thing you can do is buy the book, take it, you can read it, listen to the audio, and if you hate it, the thing you do is you can send it back, we'll refund your money, we'll refund the postage for the book, and I'll also donate $100 to your favorite charity. Is that fair? I've only had one person ever return the book, and I have just under 2,000 clients in every state of the country except for Maine. I have no clients from Maine. Every other state in the country, I have clients. Is there anyone in here from Maine? No, see, I, does anyone live in Maine? Every time I ask that, is anyone from Maine and nobody raises their hand? All right, so just so we're totally clear, just so we're totally clear on what we're talking about today. All right. Now, I'm not going to go through this, but it is something that you want to do when you go home tonight. The thing you want to do is go to YouTube, and you want to punch in YouTube the backward bicycle. It's about seven minutes long. It's just under eight minutes long, and it'll just get your mind thinking in a different way, right? Because the thing we've been taught about money is all conventional, like 401k, IRAs, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, qualified plans, where other people are controlling our money. This video on YouTube called The Backward Bicycle is something that you definitely want to go home and watch. So on your notebook or on your paper, wherever you're taking notes, write down The Backward Bicycle and this is how it starts. 
Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. Okay, so I'm not going to play it, but that's how it starts. I am going to play this, though. This is a guy that lives right here in Dallas. He's been a client of mine for, oh, I guess about six years now. Have you guys ever heard of a company called World Ventures? World Ventures is a travel network marketing company. Well, this guy, Scott Ross, he was a top income earner in World Ventures, and he left him a couple years ago, and he went out and started his own network marketing company called Experience. Um, so that's who this is. So I'll just let you listen to what he has to say. One of the most important things you're ever going to do with your, in your life is really understand money and really understand the financial game, understand how it all actually works. There's a lot of mythology out there, and there's a lot of people who make a ton of money teaching you things that are not true because it's going to serve them. And, um, you know, one of the most uh, influential guys in my life in this regard, one of the guys that I trust explicitly, one of the per people that I look to for advice and counsel is a guy named Brent Kessler. And uh, Brent is somebody who is advising and mentoring tons of leaders in this company, but also wealthy people outside of this company on how to create true wealth and how to get into the zero percent tax bracket, how to produce residual income streams just purely from causing your money to continue to turn over, over and over again. And you'll understand what I mean by that. But the flow of money is where the money is made. It's not made in sticking it somewhere or parking it somewhere. It's made in turning it over. You're going to learn these concepts today, but just think about the bank. When you put your money in the bank, they're telling you, put your money here, put your money in the bank. That's what they teach you to do. Are they leaving it in the bank? No. They're taking that money immediately and they're moving it. They're causing it to get into motion and churning it in the economy. You need the power that the banks have on your side, and that's what you're going to learn today. And I'm telling you, it is a life-changing thing. When I learned this information, I was physically upset. I was literally mad that no one had ever taught me before. So you're about to learn some information that only the elites get to hear. You're going to be led into kind of the inner circle of how finance really works. You're going to learn some of the secrets that the banks use themselves. And um, I'm just very, very excited for you. Brent is absolutely a phenomenal guy. I mean, this guy is, uh, you know, he was a millionaire apart from banking. He was a very, very successful chiropractor. He ended up learning these banking concepts. He ended up mastering the banking concepts. You'll hear his story, but he paid off a massive amount of debt using this concept. And then he's gone on to become not just a personalized expert, but now he is the go-to guy. I mean, he is traveling all over the country teaching people how to build wealth using this program. So you could not be in better hands than you're with with Brent. Uh, I love that guy. I trust him. My personal information, my personal family wealth is being um, facilitated by him and his advice and his counsel. So I just uh, am really, really excited for you. Give him your attention. Um, he's the nicest guy in the world. He's absolutely the most humble guy you'll ever meet. He'll answer any question you've got. He'll go to the ends of the earth to help you. Just trust what he's going to tell you guys. It is a game changer. Okay, so I share that with you because we're in Dallas, and he's a local Dallas guy from Prosper, Texas. So um, anyway, Scott Ross, you can look him up. I got several more success stories and testimonials on our website. You can see as well. All right, so a guy named Will Rogers. Here's what Will Rogers says. He says, the problem in America isn't so much what people don't know, it's what people think they know that just ain't so. So a lot of the stuff that we've been taught about our wealth and our money may not actually be the truth. So again, keep an open mind as I go through this, because I get it. I know how it's going to be. In about 30 minutes, a lot of you guys are going to be sitting with your arms crossed like this, looking up here and saying, that looks too good to be true, all right? I did it, I did it. I sat in your seats in 2006, and I never implemented what I'm about to share with you until 2008, because I thought it was too good to be true. So keep an open mind. As I go through this, you're going to have questions. I'm not gonna take your questions as I go through it, but I promise you, I will answer all your questions, because chances are, I already know what most of your questions are, because I do this like so many times that I'll probably answer them before the end. But if I don't, I wanna make sure that I do. So here's what I want you to do. Whenever you think of a question, I want you to write it down. Don't try to remember it because you'll forget it. 
I always say a short pencil is way better than a long memory. All right? So write down the question so we make sure that we go over it. Okay, we're going to talk about how your money flows. And I told you we're going to talk about the method to get all of your money back. For example, I'm going to show it to you in a car. And if it works in a car, it'll also work for a house. It'll work for a bicycle, a boat, a motorcycle, a cell phone, whatever, product or service, all right, that you have. The method to get all of your money back. Now, in order to do that, just for the next hour or so, all of us have to agree on what the definition of money is. So if I ask you to tell me the definition of money, what would you say? Absolutely, sir. That's exactly the same thing. Is this the first time you ever heard me? It is? The first time? Oh, very good. Usually I get a whole bunch of other answers. But that's exactly how I would define money. It's nothing more than a means of exchange, is it not? Because that's all we do with money every day is we exchange it for products and services. We exchange money for food, food for money, car for money, money for car, house for money, money for house, right? So like an iPhone for money, the money for iPhone, right? It's, it, that's all it is, is a means of exchange. So can we agree that that's going to be our definition? Are we good with that? Okay. Now, the money multiplier method. We're going to talk about the mysteries of money, the machine. What is the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth? I'm going to go over that in just a minute. We're going to talk about the mission, the marathon. Okay, so this is not a sprint. This is not a get-rich-quick deal, okay? This is something you're going to want to add into your financial life. Now, just note, I said add, not change, okay? I'm not going to... Just again, so like, I'm not asking you to change anything you're currently doing with your money. We're just going to add one extra financial step in your life, all right? It's kind of like me. Like if I got in the car and I drove to the airport and I punch in on my GPS, take me to Dallas Airport, right? So anyway, the GPS is going to compute and it's going to take me to the airport. But does that mean I can't stop to get gas on the way? No, I can stop to get gas on the way, right? So I'm going to add gas to my car on my way to the airport. So this is one thing you're going to add to your life, all right? So I'm not asking you to change. And again, this is not an investment. I'm never going to tell you how to invest, whether you like investing in stocks or bonds or gold, silver, antique cars, cryptocurrency, houses, real estate, whatever it is. Still continue to do those investments that you do. This is going to be a process of what you're going to do to make those investments. We'll talk about the millionaire and the movement. All right, I've got three calculators up here on the screen. And if you notice the one over here on the right, I'm going to say this is your savings account or your checking account at your local bank. And I'm just going to assume you guys are all from Texas. You're probably not, but I'm just going to assume that. And the thing that you do is every time you get money in, you take that money and you put it into the Bank of Texas, right? That's where you have a checking account out, yes? It doesn't matter how your money comes in, whether it's passive income, active income, someone gives you money. To, okay, so generally you put that money in the bank and you put it in somebody else's bank, i.e. the Bank of Texas, all right? Now, I'm going to say that you have $25,000 in that bank account and it's earning 4% interest in the bank account. I know it's not earning 4% interest, but I'm going to say you found a really, really good bank, and that bank is paying you 4% interest on your money. And you're in the market to buy a car, and the car is going to cost you $25,000, okay? So I'm going to be your banker, and we'll just call me Banker Brent, and here's what you do. You come into my bank, and you say, Brent, I want to take the $25,000 out of the account that's earning 4%, and I want to go pay cash for the car. And I say, no, no, no. You do not want to take out that $25,000 earning 4% and pay cash for the car. Instead, here's what I'm going to make. Okay, instead, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you a $25,000 loan, and I'm going to charge you 6% interest. Now, let's say we go to the bank to borrow $25,000 to buy a car. How long are we going to finance that car for? Five years, four years, six years? Let's just use five years or 60 months, okay? So here's what I'm saying up to this point. I want you to leave the $25,000 in the bank that's earning 4% and not take it out to pay cash for the car. Instead, I'm going to make you a loan for $25,000. I'm going to charge you 6% interest. And over the same equal time period, in this case, five years or 60 months, our bank, 
our bank will pay you more money on the 4% that you're earning than you'll pay us on the 6% that you're borrowing. Now, is that a true statement? In other words, is it possible to make more money over the same equal time period if you earn four and pay six? No, I see your head shaking no, right? Because you're thinking, well, if I earn four and pay six, I'm losing two, yes? That's exactly what I said when I was sitting in your chair. But the banker told you the truth, and let's walk through it. That $25,000 loan at 6% for five years, that means your car payment's four eighty three thirty two a month. You take four eighty three thirty two times 60, that means your total payment is $28,999. So basically, we're paying $25,000 in principal and almost $4,000 in interest. Are you with me? Yes? That same money I told you to leave in the bank earning 4% over five years or 60 months, you actually have a total of $30,525. Now, here's my question. Is this number here, the 3525, is that a larger number than 28999? Or do you guys in Texas do math differently than I do in Florida? It's a bigger number, isn't it? How can that be? How can you have a bigger number over the same equal time period earning four when you're paying six? Here's what's happening. I'm, I'm kind of hearing it. The car payment is going down every month, isn't it? The balance is going down because you're paying it down. It's on a decreasing balance. But the money that's in the bank earning four is going up. So one goes down and the other one goes up. But that's not the way our minds are programmed usually because we think if we earn four and pay six, we're losing two. The same example wor works is if I use 10 and 20%. So you can make money all day long earning 10 and paying 20. So all I wanted to do with this little exercise right here is I just wanted to prove to you that you can make money all day long earning 4% at the same time you're paying 6 Are we okay with that? All right, now why is that important? Well, let's talk about the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth. And the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth is a whole life insurance policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. I wish you guys could be standing where I'm at right now and see your faces. Because you guys are looking at me the same way I looked at the guy when I first heard this in 2006. You're thinking, what in the hell does a whole life insurance policy have anything to do with me building my wealth, right? Why on earth do you think we would want to use a whole life policy to build our wealth? No taxes? Borrow the money? Anything else? Dividends? The number one reason we're doing this is because this is what the super wealthy do. This is what the elite do. The number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world are conventional banks. Conventional banks own more in whole life insurance than all of their land and their buildings combined. As a matter of fact, since the year 2013, conventional banks have quadrupled, quadrupled their portfolio of how much whole life insurance that they own. Now, why on earth do you think banks own so much in whole life insurance? Is it because they're stupid or know something the rest of us don't know? Maybe they know something. So listen, guys, all we're going to do is mimic and imitate exactly what the wealthy do, right? The concept that I'm sharing with you, it's not a concept that I created. It's not a concept that this guy, R. Nelson Nash, created. It's been around for over 200 years, over 200 years. So it's not on trial. It's not being tested. This is what the wealthy use. Go look up and see how Walt Disney built Disney World. Look and see how Ray Kroc did McDonald's. Look at J.C. Penney's. Look at Foster Farms. Look at Stanford University. Look at Pampered Chef before Warren Buffett bought Pampered Chef. Look at how the University of Michigan pays their head coach, Jim Harbaugh, his salary. It's not something brand new. We just haven't heard about it before, right? So all we're going to do is we're going to mimic and 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 just like imitate exactly what the wealthy are doing. Now, I told you that banks are the number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world. And you're th probably thinking, sure, Brent, you can say that, but how do I know it's true? Go out and Google something called BOLI. B-O-L-I. B-O-L-I. It stands for bank-owned life insurance. Go out and Google it and see the hundreds of pages that come up about how much whole life insurance conventional banks actually own, and you can see that they've quadrupled their portfolio since 2013. Now, let's go back to that 4 and the 
Why is the 4% and the 6% important? Well, here's why. Because inside of your whole life policy in a mutual company, all right, that pays dividends, that's designed specifically for this banking concept, the guaranteed growth in your policy is 4%. That's the guaranteed growth. Now, do you think that growth is tax-free or taxable? Tax-free. And tell me what our largest eroder of wealth is. Taxes. Now, the 4% is just the guarantee. That's assuming the company does not pay a dividend. I heard this gentleman mention dividends. That's assuming the insurance company does not pay a dividend. If the insurance company pays a dividend, then that guaranteed growth is higher than 4%. Now, I can't promise you the insurance company will pay a dividend this year, next year, or 20 years from now, but all the insurance companies I write business with, all the insurance companies I work with, have been paying dividends for over 100 consecutive years. So do you think there's a pretty good chance they may pay a dividend this year, next year, five, ten years from now? Absolutely right. But I'm just going to go with the guaranteed because I want to under-promise and over-deliver. I want my numbers in real life to look better than what they look like up on the screen. So that's why the 4% is important. Well, why is the 6% important? Well, the 6% is important because that is the highest interest rate the insurance company is going to charge you to take a loan. So can we make money all day long earning four at the same time we're paying six? Are you with me? All right, let's move on. Now, we talked about the definition of money. All it is is a means of exchange. And the purpose of money, who believes in compound interest in here? Look at all the hands go up, right? You guys believe in compound interest. Who in here has a 401k and IRA retirement plan? Come on, keep them up. 401k, IRA, retirement plan, yes? Okay, a lot of you have those, right? All right, now, compound interest is a great thing. We've been taught, right? But the only way compounding works is your money has to sit still, does it not? That's the only way compound interest works. So if I want this $20 bill to earn compound interest, I have to take it, I have to give it to the bank teller, and now the bank teller has that money and it sits still, right? I'm not using that money, and it's compounding. If I go back in and get this $20 bill out, say in a week or a month, it's no longer compounding, is it? So it has to sit still, right? Now, as far as motion is a natural law of God, is it not? I mean, everything is in motion. You guys drove here today, right? Or maybe you flew here, right? You guys ate breakfast, so your food's going to be in motion pretty soon. The cars are moving, the birds are flying, the airplanes are flying around. Who goes to the store and buys produce and expects to just put it in their refrigerator and let it sit for a few weeks? Any of you? No, you wouldn't do that because it's going to spoil. Would you guys want to eat fish out of a stagnant pond? No, right? So motion, all right, is about everything that we do. But compounding stops that motion. Now, we've been told compound interest is a great thing. Well, I want you to name me one business in the world. Just pick one. Just pick one. Name me one business in the world that uses compounding or compound interest. Banks. Banks use compound interest, right? No, let's think about this. They pay you compound interest and they charge you compound interest. But they don't use it because here's what I mean. If I took this $20 bill, I highlighted it in yellow, put my initials on it, and I took it down to the local bank of Texas, and I give it to the bank teller. Does the bank teller take my $20 bill? Do they take it to the back room, and there's a little box back there that says Brent Kessler, and that's where they put it until I come back and get it? No. If I go back in a week to get that same $20 bill, are they going to give it to me? How about an hour? How about 15 minutes? No, they're not going to give me the same bill back, are they? Why are they not going to give me the same bill back? Be because they're, they're moving it. They're, it's in motion, Right. How much money does a grocery store make if groceries are compounding on the shelf and nobody's buying them? Zero. How much money does a car dealer make if cars aren't moving off the lot? How much money does a real estate investor make if nobody's buying, selling properties, moving in, moving out, doing remodels, this and that? How much does, um, you got an Apple iPhone there or an Android? How much does Apple make if nobody's buying uh, phones? How much money does this hotel make if nobody's holding conventions or checking in and checking out? How much does the airlines make if nobody's flying? Nothing. Not one business in the world actually uses compound interest. 
So isn't it a little strange that all the major institutions that promote it, banks, Wall Street, mutual funds, insurance companies, they all tell us to park our money with them and leave it sit still, but they don't do it themselves. Isn't that a little strange? Now, who in here by the show of hands had a 401k or an IRA? Okay, go ahead and keep them up. Keep them up. All right, I'm looking for... Yes, sir. So do you? Do you have your hand up? 401k IRA? Okay, keep them up. All right, sir, can you tell me, how old are you today? 70. How long did you put money in a 401k or an IRA or retirement plan? Uh, roughly, how many years? Okay, so 85 to, uh, to you turn 70, right? And so... Um, 25 years, roughly, 35 years, okay, so 35 years, now who's in control of that money, you or somebody else, somebody else is in control, is there any guarantees that that money is going to be there when you go to get it out, are there any guarantees at all with your retirement plan, there is one guarantee, it's guaranteed to never go below zero, but how exciting would that be if that actually happened? Wouldn't that suck? Now, the reason you put money into the retirement plan is why? Because it's what your parents taught you, your grandparents taught you, your friends, your colleagues, your coworkers, right? Because you wanted to have more money later, yes? Okay? Now, okay, there's no guarantees, and um, the thing you wanted to do was have more money later. So back in 1985, when you put the money in there, how old were you then? 35? Okay. So you had to keep the money in there until what age before you could take it out without paying the penalty? 59 and a half. So 35 to 59 and a half, let's call that 25 years. Now, even when you go get that money out of the retirement account, the tax is still there on the money, is it not? So the only thing you're avoiding is the penalty. So in other words, what you're saying is you kept that money in that account for 25 years, you let somebody else control it, and there was no guarantees, right? Now, let me ask you this. Three questions. Is a dollar worth more today or in the future? It's today. If you ever forget that, think about how many candy bars you could buy 20 years ago for a dollar, how many you can buy today. Number two, are taxes going to go down or up? They're going to go up. And even if they don't go up, aren't we taxed on more stuff all the time? I travel all around the country and I speak on this. And about six weeks ago, I was in Denver. And I had some downtime after I got done speaking. And I went to the store. I got my merchandise. And I came up to the counter. And I could not believe the amount of tax they wanted to charge me on the marijuana I wanted to buy. <laughs> Sir, I'm just kidding. Please don't leave. I didn't really do that. <laughs> a lot, right? So even if we don't get taxed on a higher rate, we're taxed on more stuff. Question number three, if you have choice to pay tax on the small amount of the seed or the large amount of the harvest, which one do you want to pay tax on? The seed. I agree with all three of those answers. All three of those answers you are violating by putting your money in a 401k, IRA, qualified plan, retirement account. Because what you're doing is you're giving up good dollars today to get more in the future, okay? No, I'm sorry. You're giving up your good dollars today to get weaker dollars in the future. You're compounding your tax because your tax is always going to be there. And when you do pay the tax, you're going to pay it at the higher rate. Are you with me? Now, let's go one step deeper with that. You guys told me money is a means of exchange, did you not? Money is a means of exchange. Food is money, car is money, house is money. Let's say we leave here today, we go across the street to the grocery store and we buy a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk. Are you going to wait 5, 10, 15, 20, or 30 years to either eat the bread or drink the milk? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? How about if we go buy a car or a house today? Are you going to wait 10, 20, 30 years to drive the car or move in the house? That would be ridiculous. Why are you doing that with your money? You told me all those things equal money. See, people do things with money that they would never do with things that money buys. You would never buy a loaf of bread and put it in the freezer and wait to eat it, would you? 
but you'll put money in a 401k IRA qualified pl plan and hope to use it later. It's it not even guaranteed. But guess what you tell me? You say, Brent, but if I put my money in that plan, I get a match. I get a match. Well, do you really get a match? Is that match guaranteed? Is the principle you put in there guaranteed? Well, let's go with your theory and say that you do get a match. So the thing we do is we go down to the store, we buy a loaf of bread, bring that loaf of bread home, put it in the freezer. 20 years later, we open up the freezer, and guess what's in there? Two loaves of bread. How much better is that second loaf of bread going to taste? It'll still be freezer burned, right? So I'm just trying to get you to think about you using your money now, because chances are, wherever you're putting your money, if you're putting it in one of those qualified plans, I bet a lot of you could use that money today, could you not? Because maybe you have something you want to invest in. Maybe it's cryptocurrency, real estate, right? Maybe you have credit card bills, house payment. You could use that money today, could you not? I'm just trying to get you to think about using that money today. Now, let me ask you one last question, and I'll leave this subject. Two questions. I want you to tell me every single thing you know, everything you know about your retirement account or your qualified plan. Wait a minute. Don't tell me. I'll tell you what you know. Here's what you know. You know one of two things. The thing is, is, it, is that you know if the account goes down or up based on the quarterly statement that you get, don't you? Right? And you may know if it's in a high, moderate, or low risk category. But other than that, you guys don't know crap about your retirement plan. Now, maybe one or two of you do, but most of you don't. And who's controlling it? You or someone else? Someone else. Last thing, and I'll move on. How many people, by a show of hands, now be honest, how many people of retirement age, whether it's you yourself or somebody at retirement age that you know, how many people do you know that are totally happy, ecstatic, elated, and excited and joyful about how their retirement plan has performed for them? One? Come on, is there two? Two. Three. Okay, three people of a room of what, 60? See, I don't meet too many people that are totally happy and excited about their retirement plan. Have you ever gone into a Walmart or a Costco? Do they have them here or wherever you live? And have you ever walked in there and you noticed the person at the checkout or the, the, or the person that, so as you're coming in, asking for your card, or as you're walking out, checking your receipt, a lot of times those people are at retirement age. Not all the time, but a lot of times they are, right? Now, I've never done this survey, but maybe somebody in this room will do it. So I've often thought about going up to them and just trying to find the people of retirement age and asking them this question. Uh, Ma'am, sir, are you here at this job because you want to be working at this age? Or are you here working because you have to be here working for survival because maybe your retirement account qualified plan did not perform like you thought it was going to? You guys all know people. You know people of retirement age that are working at retirement age, not because they want to, but because they have to for survival. All right, I'll leave it at that. Let's talk about how a bank works. This is how your bank works, no matter where you live. I'm just going to assume you all live in Texas. So every time you get money in your hands, what do you do with it? You put that money into the Bank of Texas, the conventional bank. And remember, I said you found a really good bank that's going to pay you 4% interest on your money. I know they're not, but you found the good one. Now, every time you put that money into the bank, that money becomes a liability to the bank, does it not? Because they owe you interest. How does the bank take your money and turn it into an asset? Loans. Loans are assets to banks. That's what banks do. They're in the money business, right? But every time we think of a loan, guess what we think of? We think of it as a debt, a payment, an expense, a liability. We have to start thinking as a loan, as an asset, the same way a bank does. Who in here besides myself has ever went to a bank to borrow money for a house? Anybody? Quite a few of you, right? So here's what you do. After you put your money into the bank, guess what you do? You go back to the bank and say, Mr. Banker, I want to take some of that money that I put in there and the depositors put in there, and I want to borrow money to buy a house. And I'm just going to say that, that, that they're going to charge you 7% interest. Don't get hung up on the numbers. I just want you to see the concept. You'll get where I'm going in a minute. If you borrow money from a bank to buy a house, are you expected to pay the bank back with interest? Yes. So who's in control of that transaction? Who's in control of that transaction? Did you guys have turkey for breakfast? Tryptophan setting in? 
The bank is in control, yes? Who in here has ever went to the bank to borrow money for a car besides myself? Let's call that 8%. If you borrow money from a bank to buy a car, do you have to pay the bank back with interest? Of course you do. Who's in control of that transaction? How about you guys that are in the real estate business? Or maybe you just did a home remodel. You did a, like a home equity line of credit. You did a new granite countertops, a kitchen, um, a patio, a pool, or something like that. I'll say you borrowed it at 9%. Well, if you borrow it from the bank, you've got to pay them back with interest. Do you not? So who's in control? See, I hope you're seeing what's going on here. Money is moving in, moving out, moving in, moving in, all right? Constantly in motion. That's why that same, 20, that same $20 bill that I highlighted is not there when I go back and get it in 30 minutes, is it? Because it's moving. Finally, how about a debt consolidation loan? You pay off all the credit cards, we'll call it 12%. That money has to go back in the banking system. Who's in control of every one of these transactions? The bank, right? Now, I know it's kind of early on a Monday morning here, and what we're going to do is a little math, and I promise I will keep the math simple, all right? Now, remember, I said you found that really good bank that's going to pay you 4% interest on your money. So here's what you do. You go out and you borrow money to buy a house at 7, so the bank made 7 and you made 4. How much more did the bank make than you? 3. How about 8 minus 4? 4. 9 minus 4? 5. And 12 minus 4 is 8. So look here. The bank made 20% and you made 4. The bank made 20 and you made 4. How much more did the bank make than you? 16%, right? Close. What about 500% more than you? Because look, ladies and gentlemen, if you made $4 and the bank made $20, didn't they make five times what you made? Yes. Banks are making between 400 and 1300% annually on the money that you leave there each and every year. Now, I know you're thinking, Brent, I hear you up there flapping your gums and moving your lips. How do I really know that's true? Here's what you can do. Go to a report. It's called BauerFinancial.com, B-A-U-E-R, BauerFinancial.com, and you can pull up any bank that you want, a small hometown bank or a big bank that we all know the names of. And you go look at your bank. I don't care if you get their annual report for this year, last year, or 20 years ago. You will see that banks make no less than 400% annually on the money that you leave there. I challenge you guys. Remember, I speak on this subject. I do 50 to 70 of these events a year. And I've been asking this for several years. And I ask you this. Go and find me a bank that makes less than 400% annually on your money. When you do, call me and tell me, and I'll change my presentation. Nobody's done it yet. If you think about it, it makes sense, does it not? Because I don't care what town you're in. You can be in my town in Port Orange, Florida. We can come to Dallas, Texas, or wherever you live, and we get in our car. And we drive in our car. We drive to the main section of town. We get to the stoplight, the major intersection. There's four corners on that intersection. Tell me what at least one building is, is that you see on at least one of those four corners on almost every major intersection? A bank, right? And yeah, and a lot of times the McDonald's has the ATM in it, doesn't it? Yeah? Or the Starbucks, yes? So you see a bank. Now, are the banks on the bad property, rundown location, bad architecture, bad landscaping, or are they the nicest buildings in town? They're the nicest buildings in town, right? And they're everywhere. Have you ever driven down the street in your town and you say, oh, look, some, there's, a, there's like a new shop coming up, a new store. I wonder what that's going to be, a new shop, a specialty store, a restaurant. You drive by there two and a half weeks later, and what is it? Another bank. Go look at this the next time you're driving around and see how many banks there are. Who do you think's paying for all of those? We are, right? So look, how much risk did the bank take to do all of this? How much risk did they take? Not a lot, because whose money did they use? They used your money. Now, I will agree, interest rate offsets risk. So the higher risk that you are, the higher interest rate that you're going to pay. But if you're too high of a risk, is the bank going to loan you the money anyway? No. So all I want you to do is to be the banker in your own life, and you keep control of that money. Because you guys are doing all of this in your life anyway right now. You're buying houses, you're buying cars, you're doing house remodels, and you're using credit cards. Who's getting all of your money? All right. BauerFinancial.com. If you find a bank making less than 400%, please call me, text me, email me, and tell me you found one, and I'll go look at it, and I'll change my presentation. All right? Let's talk about how you spend your money. 
This is how you spend your money, okay? You spend your money, 20 cents of every dollar goes to automobiles. Now, I'm not saying just the cost of the car. I'm saying the maintenance, the gas, the upkeep, insurance. 20 cents of every dollar goes to automobiles. We spend 30 cents of every dollar goes to housing, and we spend 40 cents of every dollar goes to our living expenses. So what we're doing is we're spending 90 cents of every dollar, and you're trying to save 10 cents or 10%. Now, are you aware today of what the average savings rate in America is? Four negative, okay? Last time I checked was about 18 months ago. It was between five and 6%. Prior to the recession, it was a negative number. Ever since the recession, people started to hunker down and started to save. And yes, Dallas, Texas, there was a recession. I know you guys really didn't see it much in Dallas, but if you lived in California, Arizona, or Florida, you knew what happened in the recession, right? But I'm gonna say that you guys are all above average and not just saving the average five or 6% or five or six cents of every dollar. You guys are all above average and you're saving 10 cents or 10% of every dollar. Now, how do I know you guys are above average? Because they told me when I checked in and before I spoke today, they said, Brent, the group you're gonna be speaking to is an above average group. So you guys are saving 10 cents or 10% of every dollar. Now, when most financial coaches, planners, or advisors, when they come to you to talk to you about your money, they're talking to you about what? They're talking to you about the amount you're saving, and they want to try to get you a higher rate of return on your saving. Do they not? But in order to do that, that usually involves more risk, yes? Now, how much more risk do you really want to take in today's, in, in today's environment with your money? How much more risk do you really want to take? Not a lot, do you? Here's where I'm different. I'm not going to talk to you about the amount of money that you're saving. I'm going to talk to you about the amount of money that you're already spending. And if I can just take some of the money that you're spending and move it into your savings category, in other words, transfer it to your savings category, then haven't I just increased your savings without you working harder, changing your cash flow, taking any additional risk or losing control? For example, let's say you're spending 20 cents of every dollar goes to automobiles, and we take the 20, we knock it down to 15, we take that five, we move it over here to savings, and savings goes 10 to 15, haven't I just given you a 50% increase on your savings without working hard or changing your cash flow, taking any additional risk or losing control. Yes? Okay, now let's talk about what you spend in interest. You spend five cents or 5% of every dollar goes to automobiles. Now I know a couple of you in the room are saying, not me, Brent, I don't spend any interest on automobiles because I pay all of my cars cash. And that's how you guys tell it to me. You do that chest bump like that. You say, I pay all of my cars cash, right? Now. Is it really true that when you pay cash for a car that you pay no interest? Let's think about it. There's only two reasons that you pay cash for a car. Only two reasons. Number one, you don't want to pay any payments. And number two, you don't want to pay any interest. Agree? Now, is it really true that if you pay cash for a car that you have no payments? Let's think about this. Let's make believe this is a $20,000 bill. Yes? and we go pay cash for that $20,000 car, right? We have one payment of $20,000, don't we? Or I could make $21,000 payments. So either way, I have a payment, whether it's one or 20. So how do you like to do things, systematically or on a random basis, right? Now, because even if you pay cash for the car, don't you have to start saving automatically now for the next car? Because is that car that you're driving today is the car that you're driving today gonna to last you forever? Well, let me ask you this. Who in this room is driving their very first car they ever bought? Their second car? No, man, you've went through life and you've bought and sold cars, right? And you're gonna to continue to go through life and buy and sell cars. Well, the second reason you pay cash for a car is because you're not gonna pay any interest. Well, is it true that you pay no interest? See, here's what has to happen. When you go take this $20,000 bill to pay cash for the car, that $20,000 bill was in your family. You now have to give it to the car dealer and he gives you the car, right? And that's the way we buy cars. The car dealer gets the money, you get the car, everybody walks away happy. But where is that $20,000 bill now? It's gone, it's gone. It has left your family forever. You have given up all earning right on that $20,000, have you not? 
So how about if I show you how I buy the car? I'm going to take the $20,000. I'm going to give him the $20,000 for the car, but that $20,000 is never going to leave my family. I'm never going to interrupt the compounding of the growth of that $20,000. Plus, I now have a system to get all the money back. So not only do I have the car, but now I have the money back. Would that be pretty cool? I'm going to show you that pretty soon. All right. Housing. Wow. Let's drive this one home. This is important. Who in here has a house mortgage? You have a house mortgage, sir? And on your interest rate is how much? What's the interest rate? This ballpark. 4%. Good rate, right? Doesn't matter. Three, four, five, six. You pick a rate. All right? Now, the thing is, is that you're thinking that's a good rate. 4% on my house mortgage, right? Well, let's talk about that. All right? Is it really 4%? So here's what happens every month. Whenever you get your house statement in the mail, it tells you total payment due, right? Every month, total payment due, and it's usually the same payment every month, yes? But if you break that statement down, and if you look at it closely, there's two parts to that. There's two parts to it, isn't there? There is a principal portion and an interest portion, yes? A principal portion and an interest portion. So I want you to tell me, on the statement that just came in the mail this month for your current house payment, was the interest portion of that total payment, was it 4% of the total payment or was it a lot more? What do you think? It was a lot more, right? It was a lot more. As a matter of fact, over 80% of your total house payment goes to interest in the first seven years of a 30-year mortgage. Let me repeat it. Over 80% of your total house payment goes to interest in the first seven years of a 30-year mortgage, right? How long does the average person stay in their house before they sell it or refinance it? It's five to seven. How long have you been in your house? A long time. How long's a long time? 32? 30. Have you ever refied? Never. He's outside of the norm. Who else? How long have you been in your house? Seven. How long were you in your last one? Ten. Have you, did you refi any of those? So 10 and 7, 17 divided by 2 is 8 and a half. We can go around and play the game. It's going to be an average of 5 to 7 years. So my point being is it's not about the rate. It's not about the rate of interest, right? We all get hung up in rate, rate, rate. It's not the rate. It's the volume of interest that we're paying. Because every time you refi or you sell, you start the process over, right? You start that process over again. Yes? All right, and the other thing I would ask you, and this is kind of off subject a little bit, but all of you guys that own your house outright, you have no mortgage on the house, tell me what good does that equity do you? Tell me what good does the equity in your home actually do you, other than giving you a peace of mind, knowing you have equity or it's paid for? Does it do you any good? Who's using that equity? Somebody else is using it, are they not? So I'm just trying to get you to think. Do you guys have investments that you want to make? Do you want to travel? Whatever, I mean, whatever it is, who's using that equity in your house, right? A lot of you guys I see are paying 12, 14, 16% on other interest loans, and you've got equity sitting right there in your house that you can borrow at 3, 4, and 5% all day long. Can you not? Just trying to get you to think. All right, let's go to living. We spend five cents of every dollar goes to living. So what we're doing is we're spending 34 and a half cents of every dollar goes to interest to other people, and we're trying to save 10. Can you see how it might be a little hard to get off the financial hamster wheel doing that? All right, now we're going to move into the good stuff. Everything else that I'm going to go over with you is in the handout that I gave you. And if you don't have a handout, raise your hand, and Hannah back there, my assistant, my daughter, she will give you one. Now I'm going to show you how to get all the money back on all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. So not only are you going to get the car, but you're now going to get all the money back. Okay, now, remember, I said the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth is what? A whole life insurance policy and a mutual company that pays dividends. Why are we going to use that as a machine? Because that's what the wealthy use. Right? That's what the wealthy have been doing for over 200 years. Our tax code has only been here since 1913. There's so much that you can do with this vehicle, with these features and benefits, that you cannot do with any other vehicle on the planet. And if there is another vehicle on the planet that performs like this, let me know what it is, because I've been looking. I'm a nerd about this stuff, so I look and look and look. 
I've been looking now since 2006 and have not found it. So let me know what I'm missing. Just as a side note, did you guys see, I just heard this two weeks ago. The inventor of the 401k plan, I forget his name. Does anyone know his name? Anyway, I, anyway, I forget his name. The inventor of the 401k plan. He actually came out and he said, he said, um, he said, uh, he said the 401k is a monster. He said it's not designed the way that I meant it to be designed because of government intervention and this and that. He said, he, he said it's just a disaster. And he says instead of doing a 401k, you guys need to start doing what we call a 501k. Now a 501k is not a real term or a real word, but it was his verbiage for a 501k is a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Pretty interesting, I thought. Now, and, and that I read. I, I read that so I can back that up. You can go find what a 501k plan is. And the inventor of the 401k plan is telling you not to do a 401k, all right? The inventor, the guy that created the 401k. And then I heard this. I heard that the inventor of the 401k plan has 75% of his net worth is in whole life policies in mutual companies that pay dividends. Now, I have not verified that yet to be true, but let me tell you, I'm going to dig and find it out, and you think I'll be using that in my presentations? Because a lot of you guys are sitting in 401ks, and the, the inventor of the 401k is saying, hey, it's stupid, it's not a good idea, right? All right, so that's kind of off the subject. All right, let's talk about the car example now, the machine. The machine is the whole life policy, so you have a death benefit whether you like it or not. I'm going to move here to the bigger number so you can see. Now look, over here on the left is just time. It's all it is is time. You're 1 to 8, 9 to 13, and I think it even goes further on the sheets that I gave you. And then you have two columns that are grayed out. You have age and death benefit, age and death benefit. Because yes, you do have a death benefit with this vehicle, but I don't care. I don't even care that it's life insurance. I don't care about the death benefit. We're not here meeting today to talk about death benefit. The reason we're meeting today is to talk about the cash that you have in this vehicle. That's what we're talking about is the cash. And as long as I solve your need for finance and cash, you'll have more death benefit than you can ever imagine. All right. So even though I said don't worry about age and death benefit, there's at least one or two analyticals in the room that have to know about it before I move on. So let me explain it quickly. Let's say you have three people. I don't care what age you pick them. They're all different ages, but they're all in equal health. 20, 40, 60, 30, 50, 70, you pick the ages. They all walk into the life insurance store today, and let's say they're going to put in $10,000 into their life policy. Now, this is just an example. Um, don't get hung up on $10,000 has to go in a life policy. See, two people are already leaving because I said $10,000. It's just an example, right? You can put $1,000 in your policy, $500. I will never, ever, ever tell you the amount of money that, to put in your life policy. You're going to tell me the amount you want to put in. In this example, it's $10,000. So let's say you have those three people, equal health, all different ages, 20, 40, 60. They all walk into the same life insurance store today, and they're going to put in $10,000 into their policy. All right? All right. Yes, $10,000 into their policy. Who's going to have the most death benefit? The youngest one. Yeah, who's going to have the, the highest? Who's going to have the highest death benefit? The old, no. Okay, all right, so the highest death benefit is the youngest. The lowest death benefit is the oldest. That just makes sense, right? But we're not talking about death benefit. We're talking about cash. So let's take those same three people, age 20, 40, 60, all in equal health. They walk into the same grocery store with a $20 bill. Same grocery store at the same time. Who's going to be able to buy the most groceries? All equal, right? Because when you walk in a grocery store with 20 bucks, they don't ask you about your age, your health, what color your skin is, the language you speak, right? How well you're dressed, how good you look, how bad you smell. The same $20 buys the same amount of groceries for all those people, does it not? So does it matter about age when we're talking about cash? No, and I'm driving this point home because when I'm done, somebody in here is going to have a question. They're going to say, Brent, I wish I could do this, but I'm too old. No, you're not too old. You're not too old. Your death benefit's just going to be lower than the younger guy. But the cash is not going to be any different. Are you with me? Okay, now, here's what we're going to do. Look at this. We're going to put in $10,000 a year into this policy for seven years. Now, remember, 
Don't get hung up in the number. I'm never going to tell you how much to put in. You're going to tell me how much you want to put in. In this example, he's putting in 10000 for seven years. And, uh, and here at the fourth year, he's going to go borrow from his policy and buy a $25,000 car. Okay? Now, two things. Number one, in real life, I would never, ever, ever have you stop paying premium in this policy. And number two, I would never have you wait four years to start taking out money, to borrow money from the policy. I want you to start borrowing immediately. Immediately. And my definition of immediately is within 30 days. Are you with me? But just know if you borrow earlier and you pay longer, these numbers that I'm about to show you are going to be even way bigger than what you're going to see. Now, so he's going to borrow $25,000 from his policy to buy a car. And now he's going to pay himself back over the next five years, 500 a month or 6,000 a year for a total of 30,000. So he's going to borrow 25, pay back 30. Borrow 25, pay back 30. So he's paying himself back with interest. Yes? Okay. Do you think if you borrow money from yourself, you should pay yourself back with interest? You should, but do you ever do it? No. Well, let me ask you this. If you borrow money from a bank, do you pay them back with interest? Every time, you never miss a beat, do you? So you got to start treating your money the same way you treat a bank's money. So if you borrow from them and pay them back with interest, you need to borrow from yourself and pay yourself back with interest. Because if you don't, what you're saying is your money is not as valuable as the bank's money. you got to treat your money the same way you treat a bank's. So in this case, he borrows 25 and pays back 30. Now, I want you to see what happened here after eight years. In eight years, he put in 10 times 7 is 70, 6 times 5 is 30, for a total of $100,000. He put in 100, but he took out 25 to buy the car. He put in 100, and he took out 25 to buy the car. So how much more did he put in than he took out? 100 minus 25 is what? 75,000, yes? How much cash does he have right here in his program? 73,226. So if you take 73,226, divide it into 75,000, that means he just got back 97 cents of every dollar for that first car. How would you like to have 97 cents back of every dollar for every car that you've ever bought, driven, and owned? Anyway, sir, can I ask you a question? So how old are you today? 70. You've been driving for about 55 years approximately, right? The very first car you bought 55 years ago and started driving, you still have that today. Your second car, you got that? Third or fourth? No. Out of all the cars you've ever bought up to this point in your lifetime, over the last 55 years, how much of the money do you have today? Does anyone in here have any more than zero for all the cars you've ever bought, driven, and owned? No. So if I do nothing else but get you 96 cents back for every dollar, has it been a good day? Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that I'm doing here? At all? No, man. You guys are going to buy the car anyway. All we're doing is adding one step in your financial life. We're buying a stupid-ass life insurance policy, and you're using that to buy the car. You're going to buy it anyway. Now watch this. That car wears out, so you have to go buy another one. So now I just want you to look at year 9 to 13. So now we go buy another $25,000 car in year 9. Where does that 25000 come from? It comes from the 73. We buy the car, and now, we're, now all I'm going to do is I'm going to pay myself back for the car just like I was before, 500 a month or 6000 a year for five years. I'm no longer putting deposits into my policy. I'm not putting premium dollars in anymore. I'm just using the system now to buy the car. So look at year 9 to 13. In year 9, I took out 25 and I pay back 500 a month, 6,000 a year for five years, a total of 30. So I took out 25, put back 30. Took out 25, put back 30. How much more did I put back than I took out? 5,000. You guys got that? How much cash is in here right now? 95. So it grew from 73 to 95. That is a $22,000 growth with a $5,000 net injection. How do you like buying cars my way? Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, idiotic, or crazy that I'm doing? 
No, man, I'm just buying the cars, right? Time goes on. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. There's still traffic out there when you look out your hotel window. I don't know where you guys are at in your hotel room, but I look down there and there's traffic just like stop, even on a Sunday. Where do people go in Dallas on a Sunday where the traffic just stops, right? Now, watch this. Look what happened after over 13 years. Now, sir, you said you're 70 years old. So 13 years ago, you were 57. Does that feel like just yesterday? Right? It goes by quick, doesn't it? 13 years go by quick. Yeah? The older you get, the quicker it goes. I'm 52, man, and time is flying. So I couldn't imagine what you're feeling. <laughs> right? Okay. So watch what happens in 13 years and see what we did. Remember, in year 1 to 7, 10 times 7 is 70, 6 times 5 is 30. So in the first 8 years, we put in 100 grand. In year 9 to 13, we put in 30. So we put in $130,000, did we not? One thirty in 13 years. That's what we put in. But we took out for two cars. We took out 25 in year four and 25 in year nine. So if we put in 130, took out 50, put in 130, took out 50, how much more did we put in than we took out? 130 minus 50 is 80, yes? How much money do we have in our account? It's okay to say it. 95. So in my simple chiropractic mind, how much did those cars cost us? If our net injection is 80 and we've got 95 in our account, how much did those cars cost us to buy, drive, and own? We made money. We made 15. We're 15 ahead, are we not? Now, I can't sit here and tell you that they cost you nothing because you had to start the program. You had to start the system, right? Because look, in the first year when you put in 10, that whole 10 was not available, was it? No. But are you in this for the short term or the long term? You tell me long term, but we tend to get hung up in short term thinking. Have you guys ever read a book by Rick Warren called A Purpose Driven Life? In that book, Rick Warren says life is like a marathon. It doesn't matter where you start. It only matters how you finish. This is the game of life. Right now, not only do we have uh, was our net injection 80 and we've got 95 in our account. Guess what else we have? We have two cars and the death benefit. Thank you. I didn't even I, was, I wasn't even going to talk about that, but we have two cars. Do we not? We have a car that's five years old and another car that's 10 years old on our driveway that we've owned, driven, and used the whole time. We can still continue to own, drive it, and use it. We can sell it, donate it, give it away, or whatever, right? So did I just show you how to get all the money back on all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own? And is there anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that I did here? No. Now look, the reason I showed this example as a car, because most of the time when I speak, my audience understands cars. Because I bet every one of you in this room has either ridden in a car, driven in a car, or owns a car, right? So you guys understand a car. But let's say this wasn't just one car for twenty-five thousand. Let's say if it was two cars. Let's say if it was a. Let's say if it was. Um, or, or again, I'm sorry. Instead of a twenty-five thousand dollar car, how about if it was a fifty thousand dollar car? And instead of you paying yourself six thousand a year back, you're paying yourself twelve thousand. What would happen to the numbers? They would go up. How about if mama and daddy had a $50,000 car? What would happen to the numbers? They would go up, right? Now, let's say this wasn't a car. Could you do this with a bicycle, a boat, a motorcycle? What about a house? What about a cell phone? What about clothes? What about a purse? What about shoes? What about an airline ticket? Is there anything you could not do this with? What about taxes? Ooh, could you get all your money back for all the taxes that you pay? Pay the taxes and get all the money back? Absolutely. What about charitable giving? Oh, a couple of you saying, Brent, that's not right. God does not want me to get my charitable giving money back. If God did not want you to get your charitable giving money back, he would not have me standing in the room telling you how to do it and you sitting in here listening how to do it, would he? Do you know any poor people adding wings onto any churches? Any of you? No, it doesn't matter what it is, ladies and gentlemen. We are turning every liability into an asset, every depreciating asset into an appreciating asset. No matter what it is, we're recycling and recapturing all the money that goes out to other people. Have you ever heard of a guy named Robert Kiyosaki? He wrote a book called Second Chance. In that book, Second Chance, 
This is exactly what Robert Kiyosaki talks about. Have you ever heard of a guy named Tony Robbins? He wrote a book called Master the Money Game, Mentor Money, Master Mentor Money Game, or something. Chapter 5.2. 5.2 of that book, this is exactly what Tony Robbins talks about. But you never saw it when you read it, did you? It never was explained like this. You just read it and said, oh, that looks good. Let's just move on. Again, this concept's been around for over 200 years. This is what the wealthy do. Do you think Grant Cardone would have me speak on his stage or Les Brown would have me speak on his stage if this did not work? Absolutely not. Their reputation is too big. Okay, so there's three rules, though. Three rules. Rule number one. Rule number one, pay yourself first. That's the money that you're putting into your policy premium in that whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Pay yourself first. You guys have all heard that before in your life. Pay yourself first. But do you ever do it? Do you ever pay yourself first? No. Here's what you do when you get money in. You take that money, you put it into the conventional bank of Texas or wherever you bank at, and guess what you do with the money? You pay everybody else first. You pay the car people, the house people, the student loan, the groceries, the food, the travel, the entertainment, the kids' piano lessons, the soccer practice, the braces, right? You pay everybody else first and hope there's money left over for you. You've got to start paying yourself first. Number two, pay yourself with interest. Real simple, guys. Treat your money the same way you treat a bank's money. When you borrow from somebody else or a bank, hard money lender, whatever, do you pay them back with interest? Absolutely you do. So pay yourself back with interest when you borrow money from yourself. And rule number three, recycle and recapture all of the money that's going out. We're turning every depreciating asset into an appreciating asset. Every, um, every, we're turning every liability into an asset. Three rules, pay yourself first, pay yourself with interest, Recycle, recapture, if this works for a car, what else does it work for? There are the two books right there. I gave, so that's three books I gave you today that you want to add to your wealth building library. Robert Kiyosaki, Second Chance. And if you guys don't know who Robert Kiyosaki is, you may know, you may know him. He's famous for the book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And Tony Robbins, Money, Master the Game. All right, last thing I'm going to go over with you, and you have it in your handout. And this is fun, it's cool, it's exciting. After I do this, you're going to see how I paid off $984,711 of third-party debt in 39 months. Three years and three months. Now, a couple of you in here are saying, hey, you know, I don't care about paying off debt. I don't have any debt. It's okay. You can use the same thing for expenses. You all have expenses, right? Is there anyone in here that owes nobody nothing? That owes nobody nothing? No. Well, how could you owe nobody nothing? So, so did you drive here today? Did you have to put gas in your car? Did they give you the gas for free? So you don't drive. Did you eat? Did you have to put food in your belly? Um, so tell me what town you live in. You're in Texas, okay? My in-laws live in Texas. How comfortable is it in Texas in September without any air conditioning? You have to pay taxes in Texas, right? So, guys, yes, I guess it is possible to owe no man nothing, but you would have to become indigent and homeless and own nothing, so you owe nothing. So, again, I've seen you guys around the ice cream bar and the cookie jar, so I know you can eat, right? So, let's just, since we're all into creature comforts, let's move on, yes? So, don't, my point is, don't think of this as just, as just debt. Think of it as expenses. All right, now, at the top is years. Year one, year two, and so on. You also have months, months one to 12, 13 to 24, and so on, okay? This is premium deposit. He's gonna put in $25,000 a year into this premium. Now my last example was 10,000, this is 25,000. I don't care how much you put in, you determine. You can put in monthly, quarterly, twice a year, or annually, all right? So if I was to ask you how much, and the thing is, is a lot of times you guys come to me and say, Brent, how much should I put in? How much should I put in? And I'm not going to tell you. And here's what I would tell you, sir. So are you worth at least $2.50 an hour? At least? At least $2.50 an hour, right? You guys worth at least $2.50 an hour? 
So I'm assuming you're all at least worth $250 an hour. And if you're worth $250 an hour, that means you're worth paying yourself first $250 an hour. Well, how much is $250 an hour really? How many hours in a work week? Let's just say $40. $250 an hour times $40, it's $100 a week, $400 a month, $5,000 a year. Oh, but now that you put it that way, Brent, I don't think I'm worth $250 an hour. Maybe only $1.25. All right, well, that's fine, too. $1.25, you work 40 hours a week, $50 a week, $200 a month, $2,500 a year. You decide how much you want to put in to your policy. Are you with me? In this example, my last example was ten grand a year, and this one's $25,000 a year. Now, when this guy showed up at our door, okay, now, again, I told you I'm going to show you how I paid off $984,000 in debt. I'm not going to use my exact example because it'll take way too long, but when I'm done with this example, you'll know exactly how I did it, okay? You'll know exactly how I did it. So anyway, when this guy showed up at our door, he owed these 12 third-party creditors right here. And if you notice, in each creditor that he owes, it shows the amount he owes, the amount of his minimum monthly payment, the interest rate, and how long he has left to pay on the loan, all right? Now, if you can see, I prefer you to watch up here, but if you can't, scoot closer, you can look at your sheet. I think you'll get more out of watching up here, and then you can go study that sheet I gave you in nauseating detail later, all right? So he's got 12 creditors he owes. He owes Discover, Chase, American Express, Barclays, and Lowe's, and Nordstrom's, all are credit cards, Wells Fargo, private loan, BMW, West Marine condo, and a house. So if you add those 12 debts across, it comes to over $469,000. $469,000. So I want you to write down on your paper, he owes $469,000, and he's going to put in $25,000 a year towards that debt. Okay? So let's just round down and say he only owes four fifty, dollars because I want, to make it, I want to make it better in real life than what it actually is. Okay? It's going to be better in real life than what I'm going to show you. So let's just say he owes $450,000 in debt, and he's going to put $25,000 a year towards that debt. Well, $25,000 a year, how long would it take him to pay off four fifty, dollars assuming there's no interest? A long time, somebody said, right? That's a good answer, for, a good way of saying I'm not really sure, Brent, when you do the math. It's 18 years, right? 25 goes into four. You guys are a tough crowd, man. 25 goes into 450 18 times, 18 years. So what you should have on your paper is he owes 450. It should take him 18 years at 25,000 a year, assuming no interest. So let's walk through this and see how well he does. In the very first month of the first year, he puts into his policy $25,000. In other words, he pays himself first 25,000. Immediately, how soon is immediately? Within 30 days, he can borrow out 14300 He takes that 14300 he pays off Discover, pays off Chase, pays off American Express, pays off Barclays, and he pays Lowe's down from 9500 to 7600 he, he takes that, a short pencil, I'll answer the questions at the end. What's that? He, okay, he put in twenty five in the policy. He can borrow fourteen thousand three hundred immediately. So, sir, so back when I started, were you in the room? Yes. So from the get go. So, all right. So, I, so I, were you here when I said write down your questions and I'll answer them at the end? Yes. Cash value. Write down your questions. I will answer your questions. Okay. But I think you'll see where I'm going. Just let me go through it. Remember, short pencil's better than a long memory. So he puts in 25 into the policy. He immediately borrows 14300 How soon is immediately? 30 days. He takes that money, pays off those first four creditors, and pays down lows. He takes that money that was going to the creditors because it's no longer going to the creditors because he's paid them off, So which is 160 a month. 200 a month, 200 a month, and 228 a month. Add that up, and it comes to 788 a month. So now he's going to pay himself back the same amount he was paying the creditors, 788 a month, because he no longer owes them. So by doing this, is he working harder, changing his cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control? No, he's only changing who gets the money. 
Okay? Now, he pays it back to himself. And I know you guys are thinking, what is this miscellaneous account? It's your checking account or your savings account that you have right now. That's all it is. The only reason I call it a miscellaneous account is because I recommend when you do this, not that you have to, I just recommend when you do it, you are doing this back into a separate checking account or a separate savings account that you control just like your primary, okay? Could all of us go to the bank today and open up another checking account? Yes. So the reason I'm saying this is keep these funds separate so you're not commingling them. It's okay if you commingle them. Your accountant or your tax professional will like it better at tax time if you don't. Are you with me? So it's coming back to you. And those funds that you pay yourself back, the seven eighty eight a month, you don't have to wait 30 days to use that. You use it right away, like today. Make sense? As soon as you pay it back. All right. Now, we get to the end of the first year, beginning of the second year, month 13. Okay, we put twenty-five thousand into our policy. How much can we borrow immediately? Fourteen eight. How soon is immediately? Within thirty days. So now we got the fourteen eight. Okay, that we can borrow from this twenty-five plus the ninety-four hundred that we've been paying ourselves back the previous twelve months for a total of twenty-four three. We take that twenty-four three. We pay off all of Lowe's, all of Nordstrom's. We pay off all of Wells Fargo, and we pay BMW down from 17000 down to 15000 We take that money that we were paying these three creditors, which is 287 a month, plus 276 plus 271 add it to the 788 we were paying ourselves back, and now we're paying ourselves 1622 a month. Are you with me? 1622 a month. Are you with me? Okay, now, if you notice, this private loan, it pays off on its own in month 18. It's paid off. So once that pays off, we no longer owe the 922 a month to them, so we're just going to add the 922 to the 1622 that we're paying ourselves back, and now we're paying ourselves 2544. Are you good? Yes? Okay. Now... We get to the end of the second year, beginning of the third year. I'm going to skip that. Month number 25. Now we put in 25. How much can we use immediately? 22. Can you see how this gets better every single year? Every single year it goes up, right? In a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends, your cash is going up every day. Today's better than yesterday. Tomorrow's going to be better than today. It's not me telling you that it is. It's in the policy contract. If it's not in the policy contract with these numbers that I'm showing you, then don't sign and accept the policy. All right? So now we got 22 to use plus the previous 12 months we paid ourselves 25.9. So 25.9 and 22.4 is 48.3. We take the 48.3. We pay off the BMW. So now we add the $500 a month to what we were paying ourselves back before, which was $2,544, and now we're paying ourselves $3,044 a month. Now watch this. If you guys have been sleeping up to this point, you got to wake up. There's two aha moments that I'm going to go over with you. This is the first one. So far, we're into this 25 months. We're into the third year, right? The end of the second year, beginning of the third year. How much money have we put into this policy so far in year one, two, and three? 75, right? How much have we used? We put in 75. How much have we used? Well, in the first year, we used 14 and some change. Second, 14 and some change. Third year, 22 and some change. So we put 75 in, but we're using 50. We put 75 in, but we're using 50. So if we put 75 in and we're using 50, how much is in our policy? 25, right? No. All $75,000 is in your policy growing and compounding at that guaranteed tax-free growth rate. No interruption whatsoever of the compounding because here is what's going on. When you put your dollars into the policy and it's designed okay, properly, the money that you put in, or I'm sorry, so, okay, so the money that you borrow is not your money. You don't take a loan from your money. You put your policy up for collateral, 
and you take a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. So your money is still continuing to compound and grow at that guaranteed growth rate, even though you're using all of this money. Now, is that cool or cool? I thought you guys would be a little more exciting than that. No, it's not interest fee. So, like, so like, who asked me that? So, like, were you here when I started? No, okay, but no, uh, again, I, okay. So, remember, I showed you how you can borrow at a higher rate than what you're earning all day long and make money. I showed that in the first couple slides. You guys remember that? Borrow at six and earn four and make money all day long. So, the loans aren't interest. The loans are not interest free. You're putting your policy up for collateral, but the growth is growing on all your money. And I've already proved to you how you can make money all day long borrowing at a higher rate than what you're earning. Remember back in my first 15 minutes? Okay, so all that money is growing compounded tax free. Are you with me? It, it's all growing and compounding tax free. Because remember, the money in the policy is always growing tax free because when you put the money in the policy, you already paid the tax on the money. So now it's internally in the policy, growing tax free, and the government is out of your hair. Yes? All right. Let's go back then to year three. All right. So anyway, the thing I said, we paid off the, okay, let's see, I said that we paid off the BMW. And now we get to West Marine, that automatically pays off. So when West Marine pays off, we add 1261 a month to the 3044 a month, and now we're paying ourselves 4305 a month. Are you with me? We get to the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year, month 37. All we're doing, guys, is living life. It's just time. It's just time that's going on. Now look what happens when we get to the end of the third, beginning of the fourth year. We put in 25. How much can we borrow now within 30 days? More than we put in, yes? We put in 25, can borrow almost 26. We got the 26 plus the 41. We paid ourselves back previously for a total of 67,000. Now we take the 67,000 and we pay down the condo. Down, not off. I don't have enough money. I owe 81 on the condo. I don't have enough to pay it off. So I'm not going to change how I'm paying myself back. I'm going to keep it at 4300 a month. Are we good? Okay, almost done. End of the fourth year, beginning of the fifth year, month 49. We put in 25 into the policy again. Now we've got 26.8, almost 27 to use. 27 plus, say, 51. So we got $78,000 here to use. And now we pay off the house because the condo paid off at the end uh, here in month 48. So now we pay down the house from 181 to 102. We continue to pay ourselves 54.84 a month. Get to the end of the fifth year, beginning of the sixth year. We pay our premium again of 10. Okay, now we're only paying 10,000. How much were we supposed to be paying? 25. Why are we only paying 10? The reason is there's two parts to the policy. There's a base premium and a paid up additions rider premium, okay? In the beginning stage of the policy, the paid up additions rider is what's driving the cash value. Now that the policy is older, more seasons, more efficient, now the base premium is driving the cash value. So we drop off that paid up additions rider and we're only paying 10,000 in premium into the policy. Here's how I want you to think of the paid up additions rider. Have you ever seen the space shuttle take off into space? And when the shuttle takes off, it's got the shuttle and two booster rockets, does it not? When that shuttle gets way up in the air, what happens to those booster rockets? They fall off. And why do they fall off? Exactly. It's no longer needed. So that's why we drop off the paid up addition rider. Now, remember earlier I said you're never, ever, ever going to want to stop paying your premium into your whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Remember that? Now that we put in this 10,000, how much can we use right away? 13,000. Now I'm not a math genius or anything. As a matter of fact, it took me 13 trimesters to pass 10 trimesters of chiropractic college 
when I did pass chiropractic college and walked across the stage and got my diploma, I still couldn't get paid to treat patients because there was this thing called national boards you had to take. And I failed part three of national boards three times, and they only give you the test once every six months. So I took it, failed, and had to wait and wait and wait, right? So I am not the brightest candle on the cake or the sharpest tool in the shed, but I understand this. If I put in 10 grand and I got 13,000 to use immediately, is that not a 30% increase on my money? How much of your money do you want growing at 30% and more? The correct answer would be all of it. So if you ever think you wanna stop paying your premium in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends, you guys do not need financial counseling, you need severe psychiatric care, all right? Because how hard is it for you to give me 10 bucks if I'm gonna give you 13? Or a dollar if I'm gonna give you a dollar 30 or a thousand 1300? But remember, you're never gonna give me a dime, right? You're gonna buy the policy, you're gonna put the money in the policy in these 100 year old insurance companies where nobody has ever lost, nobody in your state has ever lost money in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Go look it up and try to find it and tell me where it's at. So now we're gonna start a brand new policy for 25,000. If you work with us, you'll never wait five years to start a second policy. I have almost 2,000 clients all around the country. 91% of my clients that have been with me a year or longer have more than one policy, 91%. The reason I tell you that, if this concept wasn't working that I'm sharing with you today, do you think nine out of 10 would come back and buy more? Absolutely not, right? So can you open up a second policy? Well, let me ask you this. The bank that you bank at, is there one branch or multiple branches? Multiple. So can you have multiple branches of your bank, banks, i.e. policies? Absolutely. Okay, we're almost done. So here's what we are able to use. We're able to use 13 plus the 14 on the new policy, plus the 65 we've been paying ourselves back for a total of 93,000. Well, we only owe 90,000 on the house. So we completely pay off that last house. All that debt is now wiped out. $469,000 of debt to the third party creditor is paid off. How long did I say it was gonna take us to do it when we started? 18 years. It didn't take 18 years, did it? It took, um, this was my alarm just telling me, Brent, hurry up, you're running your mouth too much. Um, it didn't take 18 years, did it? It didn't take 15, it didn't take 10. We did it in five years and a month. How happy do you think this family was? Is there anything stupid, crazy, ridiculous, or idiotic that we did at all? No, man, all we did is we added a life insurance policy and we're using that for the banking system. Now watch this. He had $469,000 of debt. Well, how much outside money did he put in to pay off the debt? How much did he put in in year one? 25. Year two, 25. Three, four, and five, 25. So that's 125 plus 10 is 135 plus 15 or plus 25 is 160. So he injected $160,000 of outside money and paid off $469,000 of debt. Could he have went faster if he wanted to? Sure, he could have paid more premium, he could have paid himself back more, he could have started more policies earlier. Could he have went slower if he wanted to? Yeah, he could have not paid himself back, he could have paid less in premium, he could have said I'm only worth a buck 25 an hour. You know, however fast you go is up to you. Now do you see how I paid off $984,000 of debt? I just did more premium and went faster, that's it. I just went a little faster. Okay, the speed and how you go is up to you. There is no risk factor at all with this. Like I said, nobody's ever lost money in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. The only risk factor is you. Is you are the only risk factor and how you use it. And who do you know better than you? Nobody, right? Okay, now watch this. This is a second aha moment. Let's just take the last two debts, the condo and the house. Just the last two. Okay, not even the first 10. And I'm gonna say that he went through this and now what he's gonna do is play honest banker with himself and continue to pay himself back the money he had already agreed to pay the bank for the condo and the house. Now if you'll look on the condo, how much was his monthly payment? Was it 11.79 a month? 
on the condo. How long did he have left to pay it when we started? 122 months, does it say? Yes, on the condo. How long? No, it says months on there. Okay, it's 122 months. Anyways, on the months, work with me. You'll see where I'm going. 122 months is when he showed up at our door. That's how long he had left to pay on it. But I've been doing this for 61 months, haven't I? So i got to be fair and subtract those 61 months. So if he did not do this, he would still have another 61 months left to pay on the condo. Would he not? 122 minus 61 is 61. What I'm going to show you is how much more money he would have in his pocket if he just continues to pay himself back the same money he had already agreed and signed up for to pay the mortgage company. Let's do the house. Okay, how much is the house payment? Is it fourteen twenty one a month? Is that right? How many months did he have left to pay on it when he showed up at our door? Two nineteen minus sixty one. He would still have one hundred and fifty eight months left. If he does nothing more but pay himself back the money he had already agreed to pay them, add those two numbers up: two twenty four and seventy one. He would have two hundred and ninety five thousand dollars in his pocket plus the house and the condo. If he doesn't do this, who gets the money? The bank. Who's getting your money? But here's a second aha moment. It even gets better than that. Because remember, inside the policy, there's a guaranteed tax-free growth rate. Do you remember what that is? 4%. So we got to add the 4% to those numbers, don't we? So if we pay ourselves back, just like we had already agreed to pay the creditors, you would have $371,000 more in your pocket plus the house and the condo. If he doesn't do this again, who gets that $371,000? The bank. Who's getting all of your money? Just trying to get you guys to think. Look, now that you know this, everybody should do this. I don't care if you make $10 an hour or $10,000 an hour. Everybody needs to break the bonds of financial slavery. You don't even realize you're in and start taking control of your own wealth and your own money. If you don't do this, in my opinion, not only are you stealing from yourself, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and future generations to come, because you're letting money leave your family. You see the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, and the Barclays, they all understood how to leave money in their, to keep the money in their family. All right? So all we're going to do is mimic and imitate what the wealthy do. That's it. We're just going to play the game. Look, guys, there's us and the super wealthy. Us and the super wealthy, right? We all have the same financial tools. Do you guys agree with that? The only difference between us and them is they use the financial tools differently. Now that I know how to play the game, I'm going to play the game right along with them. Have you guys ever heard of a guy named Warren Buffett? I don't know when Warren Buffett said this, but I think about this every day of my life. I heard it in October of 2008 was the first time I heard it. And this is how simple it is to me. Just do what Warren Buffett says. If poor people would just start doing what rich people do, they wouldn't be poor anymore. How much sense does that make? All we're going to do is mimic and imitate exactly what the wealthy do. Only one of two things are going to happen to every one of us in this room. Only one of two things are possible in the next 10 minutes, 10 days, 10 hours, 10 months, 10, 20, 50 years. Only one of two things are possible to happen. We're going to live or we're going to die. Now, I like to use the word graduate. You can use die, pass, whatever word you want. But we're going to live or we're going to die. If we live, are we better off with or without this system I just shared with you? Hopefully with. If we die, not if. When we die, are our beneficiaries better off with or without? With. How much today did I even talk about the death benefit? How much did I even talk about life insurance? No, man, this is just a vehicle we can use. How much did I talk about policies are exempt from lawsuits and judgments in most states? Texas being one of them. How much should I talk about the internal growth of the policy grows tax-free? How much should I talk about your loan never has to be repaid back? Your loan never has to be repaid back. A loan is a prepayment of the death benefit. You're borrowing against your death benefit. You're using your good dollars today, and you're going to pay them back with weaker dollars in the future. Why are we doing this? Not the only reason, but one reason we're doing this. I want to be a billionaire. So freaking bad Buy all of the things I never had Okay, look, if this is something that you think you want to do or you want to know more about this, here's what I want you to do. Anyway, all right, so my daughter back there, Hannah, 
The thing I want you to do is I want you to give me your phone number, email, and name. Phone number, email, and names. And just like preferably a phone number that you'll text, all right? Do not give us your contact information if you don't want to know more about this or how it can work for you. Don't give it to us just to be nice, okay? Please. If you do give it to us, please give me contact info that you will actually answer and respond to when we call you. All right? Don't make us go through your gatekeepers to find you. Fair enough? Okay? Now, I'm going to go over to the bullpen now, and I'm over there for an hour and 15 minutes. Depending on who's over there, I'll go through questions and answers first. So if you guys want to come over there and go through question and answers, I'm over there from 1.15. Um, no, what is it? 12, I'm on Eastern time. 12.15 to 1.30. Is that right, Hannah? So I'm there 12.15 to 1.30. I'll go through questions and answers, go into a little more advanced strategies. If there's somebody that you think should hear this information, and then also our booth is right next to the bullpen, if there's somebody you think should hear this information, the thing you can do is watch this presentation recorded. Not this exact one, but I have a recorded presentation. Just go to the website, themoneymultiplier.com. Scroll to the bottom of the home page where it says member area. Click on that and enter the password bank with Brent and you can view that presentation again. Good deal. Fair enough. All right. Two minutes for questions. Give me three questions. Three questions. I can take three before I move. Anybody? Yes. Yes. Great question. Why a second policy? The problem is, the reason a second policy is because you can't put more money in that first one, you'll overfill it. In other words, I can only get 12 ounces of water, I'm, I'm sorry, I can only, I, so I can't get 12 ounces of water in a 10 ounce glass. And if you overfill the policy, it becomes what we call a MEC, modified endowment contract. If your policy becomes a MEC, it's no longer treated as an insurance contract, it's treated as an investment and subject to taxation. So that's why the, the, the need for more policies. I own 19 policies. I do about a half a million a year in my own policies, and I buy at least one policy every year. Because how much of my money do I want getting into that third and fourth year and beyond? As much as possible. What's that? No, well, the 25 is what his amount was. That's what he came up with. He, he determined that. It depends on your age and your health, your gross income and your net worth. Because the insurance company is going to look at you and they're going to assign a value to your life. Kind of scary, but that's the way they do it. No, not five policies. I bought one policy until the end of the fifth year, beginning of the sixth year. That premium was in policy one. Just, all right, so go look at the header. The first policy, the second policy I started in month 61. That's one policy paying 25000 annual for the first five years and then 10000 annual. One more question. Yeah? Yep. Absolutely. There's no better way to save for college. In my advanced training, I go through a whole college. So as far as that 529 crap, you don't want that. I mean, you don't. You don't want 529. So look, so like my father-in-law, right, because I'm the stupid son-in-law, he says, I'm going to set my kids up with a 529. Well, my kid's going just to be a pilot through private school, and he can't use the 529 plan he set up for him. So what's going to happen to the 529 plan, right? And college is a little overrated anyway, isn't it? I'm sorry, that's another subject. All right. All right. Okay, guys, I'm going to the bullpen. Bullpen, right, that big open session where all the vendors are. And, and, and I'm going to be try to be louder than them.